I'm Sarah Wild, I'm the head teacher of Limpsville Grange. Thank you so much for inviting us to come and uh, talk with you today. We're really excited if, uh, and a bit nervous. A bit nervous? Yeah, a bit nervous. So we're going to tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, I've got Lucy and Moya and Beth uh, on stage, and then I've got Joe, who's deputy head of care in the wings. Uh, Joe's been in charge of all the travel arrangements this morning because I'm a bit scatty when it comes to knowing where I'm going uh, and she's also keeping us all quite calm this morning. So if she appears on stage it just means somebody's having a bit of a peak in their anxiety and Joe's just going to be around to kind of help them manage that. Okay, right. Can, can you click the, can you have a go at seeing whether or not we can get onto the next slide Lucy, would that be okay? Fabulous, well done. So Limpsville Grange is a, it's a Surrey County Council special school. Uh, we're a residential provision, but we do have uh, a lot of day places. Um, we've got 73 students and 62% of the girls are on the autistic spectrum, which I think, I don't know for sure, but I think is the largest community of autistic <coughs> teenage girls in one place in the country. Um, it's a really amazing place, actually. So uh, 11 to 16, GCSEs, mainstream curriculum, uh, really trying to, to make sure that the girls are well prepared for tackling the challenges of you know, everyday living when they leave us. Um, we're located in a really beautiful Victorian manor house in 11 acres of grounds. Uh, we've got, we, we do lots and lots and lots of things with animals. Uh, so we've got lots of animals. Um, we've got alpacas, sheep, goats, lots of dogs in classrooms, uh, a couple of cats. Um, so yeah, we have lo lots of animals and actually the girls really enjoy working with and engaging with the animals. And I think for some of them, that's really important in helping them manage how they feel and their anxiety. In terms of our cohort, our cohort is quite uh, interesting. So although we only have 73 students, uh, we, we do have a very high number of students who are, who are looked after. Uh, we also have a very high number of students who are um, adopted from care, so that, that makes up about a quarter of the school. Uh, and in terms of our pupil premium, so the, the number of students that come from a disadvantaged background, that's um, at about 40%, which is very high when you think that the rest of Surrey is at about 9%. So in terms of disadvantage for the girls at home, there's, there's quite a lot of that. And what we're doing all the time, alongside trying to get them through lots of fantastic qualifications and get them ready for, you know, get them life ready, and maybe get society a bit limps or grained ready as well, is uh, we're trying to focus on uh, developing those skills that really are going to help them to be successful adults. So things like, you know, their independence. And that's, that's quite broad, actually, independence, isn't it? That can be anything from feeling like you can tackle a piece of work on your own to being able to go to Morrison's, use the bus, go to Morrison's, buy your tea, come back, make your tea, wash up, you know, and then do your homework, which is actually where we get them to in year 11, hopefully, pretty much. Um, we work on emotional and, and mental resilience. Resilience has got a bit trendy, hasn't it? <laughs> Lots of people like talking about resilience. Um, I think... What we try and say to the girls a lot is that actually life is hard for lots of people uh, and actually, you know, life is hard for everybody some days uh, and you've just got to be able to keep going at it, haven't you? When things are difficult and you suffer from setbacks, you've got to be able to re-engage with things um, emotionally when things are difficult or mentally when things are difficult. And so we talk to them about that right from the very beginning. And I think when you see our documentary, the documentary labelled it Tough Love, I'm not sure really if that's, if that's true, but I think it's just about, you know, trying to stay actually, you're just going to have to get on with this. So we, we talk about that quite a lot with the girls, don't we? Do we say that to you a lot? Yeah. You just have to get on with it. <laughs> yeah. It's probably quite annoying, actually, isn't it? <laughs> uh, we obviously develop their communication skills. Uh, uh, lots of work on self-esteem. I think often when the girls come to us, sometimes uh, some of the girls are lucky enough to come to us in year seven, but often they come to us after having had a, a series of probably quite unpleasant and, and difficult experiences in mainstream primary and secondary schools and sometimes with their families. Um, and so it's actually about building them up and making sure that they believe in themselves as people and as learners. Uh, and we, we do a lot of work with them all the time about that. Uh, and also self-regulation and managing their emotions because, you know, I don't know about you, but I find life quite tricky. Sometimes I've got a bit of a short fuse sometimes. 
Uh, but actually, you know, if somebody uses my mug in school, I can't have a 20-minute yodel in the library using all of my favourite Anglo-Saxon words. I just can't. It's not allowed, apparently. So we have to try and make sure that the girls understand that actually if you, f if you have peaks in your anxiety or, you, you know, you have a bit of a meltdown, yes, that's, all, pe all people might feel like that, but actually how are we going to do this? How are you going to manage this in a more socially acceptable way? Because ultimately you are going to be joining society and when you go to work... If your boss tells you something that you don't really want to hear, you can't really tell them to stick it. So that's just not okay. So we spend lots of time talking to them about that. Don't we, Beth? We, we say that a lot, don't we? It's not socially acceptable behaviour. Um, we really want the girls. You know, the girls are fantastic. We've got some really very bright young women with me today, actually, with so much potential. So actually, more than anything, I want them to be able to go into society and be economically viable adults, because there's absolutely no reason why that can't be the case. Uh, and actually, you know, I think they want to go and do fantastic things. I know I was talking to, to Lucy on the way up, and Lucy wants to be a... Bio, um, biomedical engineer. You want to be a biomedical engineer, you know, and actually... Great, good, please do. I think that would be very important that you, that you do do those things. So whether it's being a biomedical engineer or, you're, you, know, or you want to work in Sainsbury's, all of those things are, are really important. And so what do we need to do to help you to be economically viable as adults? As I talked about, mainstream expectations. So as much as possible, it relative, well, relative to your start points, obviously, but when you come in, you know, there's, right from the word go, it's talking about your responsibility as a student for your part in our bargain in learning uh, and the responsibility that you need to take for you know, completing work and getting it done and being serious about your studies uh, because actually that, you know, you're not a passive... This isn't a journey that you just sit back and take no responsibility for. This is your life, and so you're going to have to make a contribution towards it. And we have really high expectations for progress, which I'm pleased to say the girls meet regularly. So, um, you know, it's, we, we do push them quite hard, uh, but, but we know them really well, so we can do that. And obviously we have a, a residential curriculum where we um, can work on lots of different things. So we can, right from the beginning in year seven when they come in, I'm always amazed at how many year, year seven girls can't do their teeth, actually, because obviously doing your teeth is a bit of a big thing. So, you know, right from doing your teeth in year seven and talking about brushing your hair and self, you know, basic self-care skills, right the way up to, you know, going to a supermarket, buying some stuff and making your own tea in year 11 and everything in between that, really. Um, and we've also, in the um, residential team, we've also devised a programme where we're looking at... Um, we run various different focus groups, so we have, like, mindfulness groups and speech and language therapy groups that the, the residential team run themselves. Um, because, obviously, access to other services is, is, is limited. Um, and we're a state school, so we haven't got, like, bags of money in a speech and language therapist or in our own EP or any of those things. You know, we've got... 11 teachers and a care team of six uh, and we've got 20p to run the whole show on so we, we are very creative in terms of trying to make sure that we we can offer a range of um, activities so in terms of what the cohort at Limpsville Grange is like we've got you know roughly a 60 40 split I think the girls who aren't on the spectrum largely have difficulties with um, social communication we have some girls who find learning a bit more difficult. We have some girls who have um, difficulties around attachment. Um, I think probably, you know, 62% of the school have a diagnosis of autism. I think it's probably nearer 75% who are, who, are, who are not really diagnosed. Um, so in terms of what that looks like when you look at them as a, as a group of fantastic, awe-inspiring and slightly terrifying young women, um, that we, we have really clear characteristics that I, I think we can say definitely exist within Limpsville Grange. I think, you know, the, the roller coaster of anxiety, the girl's going to talk about that <clears throat> in a bit, uh, and also in, our, in the book that we've written, which um, I've only bought three copies, but I will tell you where you can buy it. Um, we talk about anxiety a lot in our, in our novel that we've written, which is called Emmys for Autism, which Lucy, well, I, I will talk about a bit later on and about actually how anxiety can have such a massive effect on your capacity to function, learn, talk to your friends, eat your lunch, whatever it is, uh, sleep, um, that actually, you know, all the time we are trying to manage that anxiety and help them to self-manage that anxiety as well. And also get them to understand that sometimes their behaviour, that, you know, having a massive meltdown, what, what were you worried about? Were you anxious about something beforehand? And what can we do to put in place to support you so that we don't get to a massive meltdown as a result? of your anxiety. Masking, um, 
We, we call it social formatting, actually, at Limpsall Grange, because it's a bit like copying and pasting bits of a document into another document without necessarily always understanding what it means. So I think there's an awful lot of kind of horizon scanning, uh, looking and observing other people's um, interactions, social communication, kind of <coughs> replicating it sometimes out of context, obviously, and then and then wondering why things are going a bit wrong. So we talk about that um, quite a lot. And I think because we're in not a neurotypical environment, um, I hope that the girls feel that they don't have to do that too much and that they can just be themselves. And actually, if we get things, if things are a little bit off key, then we can talk about, well, what would have been a, a different way of going about that piece of social interaction. Learning to self-regulate, I've talked about before, it's really, really important because actually if you're going to be economically viable, you have to be able to self-regulate and actually nobody likes to be in crisis. So I think what we do find is that the younger students, you know, you see a peak in behaviour in years seven and eight, then things start to settle down in year nine and hopefully by the time we get to year 11, there might be other behaviours that come out, but actually those kind of big meltdowns by and large have disappeared. Am I making that up, Joe? Have I just over the pudding there a bit? I was just thinking about yesterday. As I was saying that, I was thinking yesterday we were doing mock exams. Some people in year 11 weren't that great yesterday, to be honest, so maybe I'm being a bit optimistic. Um, but it's teaching them the skills so that they can do it themselves because they are not always going to have a responsible adult on their shoulder guiding them. So, you know, they, these are really bright, intelligent girls. They've got to be able to do this themselves. Relationship difficulties. Friendships. So Felicity's piece of research, I tweeted about it this morning, about um, girls on the spectrum really kind of seeking friendships in a similar way or having a similar function for them as their neurotypical female peers. Absolutely the case. I think friendships are the biggest thing in Limpsville Grange. And when the girls come in year seven, <clears throat> often they've never experienced any friendships, any meaningful friendships, and they've been really lonely. Uh, and there's been a lot. The Mental Health Foundation have been tweeting out about loneliness this year. Uh, this week, and actually I found it quite interesting that there was an age bias built into that, because my experience is, is that loneliness is not something that just lives in a particular section of society, actually, and I think some of the girls that come to the Grange have been really lonely and socially isolated before they get to us, and then they find a community of people who are like them, and they relax a bit, and, and so friendships become very important, the intensity of friendships can sometimes be quite big, uh, and then I think it's about teaching strategies for, you know, Relationships need repairing, sometimes they need rebuilding, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes you need to finish a relationship, a friendship with somebody. Um, how do you share friends when actually that one person might become one of your specialist interests and they might also become somebody else's specialist interests? So it can be very tricky, but we talk about friendships a lot. Difficulties understanding and processing the world. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously sensory needs that come into that. Um, we talk to the girls a lot about their sensory needs, um, but we don't have a low arousal environment particularly, um, and that's partly because, actually, when they go into the world, the world isn't a low, envir a low arousal environment. And people have different, different views on that. I think, you know, if the girls need particular strategies or particular pieces of equipment to help them access our environment, then we're, we, we will work with them to do that. Um, Additional mental health difficulties, I think particularly in the, uh, in the Aspie cohort, I think that, that you know, there's some evidence to suggest that, that mental health difficulties are maybe more prevalent. Um, I know that we've, we've definitely got some girls who do have some pretty significant mental health difficulties and so we work with an, a range of um, other partners to help meet those and you know, that ranges from girls being day pay, day girls with us and inpatients in psychiatric units in the evening, through to working with CAMS. Um, although, you know, I'm aware that CAMS has been cut a lot over the last five years, certainly, and so actually getting into CAMS is sometimes difficult. If you have an autism diagnosis, getting into CAMS is doubly difficult, I think, because sometimes there are, there are conversations about, well, this is about your autism, and actually, I think, increasingly, we're able to say, actually, this is over and above the level of anxiety or worry or difficulty that we would expect to see in a, in a girl with autism at this age. So actually, we, I think we've got quite a good evidence base to then have another conversation with CAMS about whether or not it is a mental health difficulty <coughs> or, or we think we'd like them to investigate it, please. Um, safeguarding and social vulnerabilities are just enormous. So 80% uh, of the school have a safeguarding file. Uh, I think, you know, in this day and age when you've got the internet in your pocket, that presents <coughs> an enormous uh, risk. 
Um, but that is the world that they live in. And so it's actually it's about teaching them to be safe, teaching them what's acceptable. Um, I think sometimes if, you've, if you have low self-esteem and you really want to connect with other people your own age, you, you are, it's easy to be manipulated. And also if you, if you understand or you, or you believe everything that somebody tells you online, again, it's quite easy to be manipulated. So I think, you know, e-safety in particular is an area that I've seen go up massively in the last three years probably. Um, and I think that's a real worry. And also, you know, additional needs relating to family context. I think as professionals sometimes, I don't maybe you probably don't do this, but I think as educators sometimes we kind of like, you know, we're in school and so we see the we see students through the prism of a school context. And it's not really until you think, but actually then they go home, what's happening at home, that you realise that actually sometimes, you know, these young people are living in really <coughs> complex families with and there's a lot going on. So, you know, there are there are some really interesting characteristics of our cohort. I've just realised I've gone past my documentary slot. So I think to give you a flavour of what it's like at Limitsville Grange, we made a documentary, as you do, with ITV. Because when you've got all that going on and somebody says, do you want to make a documentary as a head teacher? Of course you go, yeah, of course we do. Brilliant. Yeah. Do you want to come in for six months every day? Brilliant. Come on in. Over the winter? Yeah. Come on in. So we had a film crew in for every day for six months. Uh, and I didn't, a lot of the time I didn't even know where they were. So it was, it was um, somebody in a camera and somebody else that was with them and they basically just had free reign. And we talked a lot about what was happening and I remember sitting down with Nick after the third week and he said, well, nothing, nothing very exceptional is happening here. Uh, it's just a school for girls. And I just said, just you wait a bit. And lo and behold, that afternoon, he came in ashen-faced at the end of the afternoon. He said, oh, no, I can see. <laughs> Things are a bit different. I was like, yes, they are. So um, I'm just going to play you. If Peter could just play a clip. It's just two and a half minutes that just gives you a little bit of a flavour of, of kind of what the school is, is like. Can you do that? Thank you. So that the reason that we made the documentary, I realised I probably sounded a bit flippant earlier on, is um, in about nearly coming up two years ago, the girls uh, started really hassling me in uh, in the way that they do because they're fantastic, and saying, whoa, whoa, we want to make a film uh, about what it's like to be us because everything about autism is about boys." And so I said, "Okay, that's fine." So they they got a, a little grant, five hundred pounds together. <coughs> 
And we contacted uh, a media company in London and they came down and made the, uh, a, like a five minute YouTube um, film that we then we just, just put on the internet. And I think we've got about 25,000 hits on it. Um, and it was just the girls made it themselves. Nobody scripted it. They came in for two days. The, the media company at the end of the two days basically said they'd do it for free and then said, would we like to make a documentary? And so, you know, I talked to my leadership team and my governors. I talked to the girls about it. And I think we all just really felt that we just needed to do something if we could just to get people other people to understand that actually autism in girls looks really different and so this is what it's like for them um, so it was really about raising awareness and the response to the documentary has just been enormous it was I think 1.3 million viewers which is quite a lot for that time of night um, we've just been contacted by people all over the world asking kind of you know what can I do um, I think really what it's highlighted to me is actually there's hardly any there's no support out there there's there's very little um, and so it's just really encouraging other people to kind of start networks uh, and, and share ideas because actually we're, we're not the fountains of all knowledge we just do what we do with the girls that we've got um, sometimes we do it well and other times we don't do it so well and it's about reflecting on our practice and moving that forwards I'm just going to speak for two more minutes and then I'm going to hand over to the girls so if I could Lucy if you could just have the next um, slide so in, in my view uh, last night when I was writing this presentation a bit late um, I was thinking you know what are the what are the key messages for me what are the key problems really and the things that we're facing and I think you know the the late identification or no identification at all um, is really unhelpful and I know you guys have had a conversation about labels what I would say practically from our point of view is actually if you go through life and you're feeling really different and you're often getting things wrong socially and you don't know why then actually having a label that, that explains you to you and you to other people is really helpful. It is really helpful. And I'd, I'd be really interested to hear the girls' views on, on that. And they're going to talk about how they feel about their autism in a bit. Um, and it is also, it's, it's, a label is a gateway to services. Now, the girls don't, there are no services designed out there for women and girls, to my knowledge, and we do look. Um, so actually, if you don't have any labels, then you don't really have any access to resources. And so actually, I think you're doubly disempowered because the rest of society doesn't really understand who you are. You're not really understanding who you are and there's nothing out there to help you. So for me and for our school, we think identification is really important. The whole lack of, I was, uh, lack of awareness, I was going to put the curse of Rain Man up there, actually. How many times have I had parents sobbing in my office saying the doctor said she couldn't be autistic because she, she can make eye contact? She can have a two-way conversation. Yes, she can. Doesn't mean she's not on the spectrum. So it's about professionals, lots of professionals, lots of different groups of professionals, understanding what female autism looks like. Because it doesn't look the same as male autism at all. Lack of services, which just drives me completely crackers. Um, Lack of services and replicating autistic male behaviours are, are kind of linked because actually quite often the girls that are diagnosed early end up in boy heavy provisions and then what they do because they're female is they're scanning other people's behaviour and then they're replicating it back. So actually what you end up with is lots of autistic girls being socialised like autistic boys which actually in our society is not at all helpful. You know we are not kind to train spotting women here. We're not. Actually, there are certain unspoken rules about being a woman in a Western society that you kind of have to go with. You can choose not to go with them if you want to, but actually to not know what those rules are is a little bit unfair. So actually, you know, the, the fact that there aren't very many services, the fact that actually quite often the diagnosed girls end up kind of like in a cul-de-sac of, of boys, which it doesn't really help them. And also, I think the whole idea, well, the experiences of, of adult autistic women who don't get diagnosed until they're 40 or 50. And, you know, Lana Grant, who is, uh, she's in the West Midlands and she works with uh, autistic women having babies. She's a doula. She's amazing. Uh, and also Dana Gassner in uh, America speak and write incredibly powerfully about the fact that, you know, they were both diagnosed when they were 38. They both have children on the spectrum. They were diagnosed off the back of their daughters or sons being diagnosed. Uh, and actually how difficult it is for them to get to nearly 40 thinking, I'm always getting this wrong, and for people to be receiving negative feedback about yourself the whole time and not know what that's about and just think that you're a bit wrong and a bit broken, actually just reinforces for me the idea that an identification, a label, is quite helpful. And they found it really empowering to have this label at 38 or 40. And now, you know, now they talk and, and speak about it a lot. Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop talking now because it's not about me anyway. And I could talk for ages. 
Can I? So I'm going to hand over to the people that are really important here and who are far more interesting than me. Um, I'm going to hand over to the girls and they're going to just share with you some of their um, experiences and thoughts about, you know, how their autism impacts on them. Over to you, Lucy. I get this slide up. No, we can move it. So we are three girls who um, attend Limpsville Grange and we just wanted to sort of talk to you about our autism, how it affects us and what we think would be beneficial to us um, in the future, so, such as like um, strategies. Uh, hello. Uh, I am Moya and I am 15. I'm one of the year 11s at Limpsville Grange School. Previously, I came from a mainstream school, and that went horrifically for me, since I was socially isolated. My interests are things like art and just being imaginative in general. People would often believe that autistic people aren't very creative, right? Well, they're very wrong, because this person is like the rainbow of imagination <laughs> and how I feel about my autism well at first I didn't feel very happy about it but now I love it because it makes me the person I am and actually I wouldn't be the same without it I might not have been creative I could have just been a neurotypical girl taking selfies and sitting in the back of the class chatting about boys, but I'm far from that, I'll tell you. Uh, my name is uh, Lucy and I have a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome. Um, how I feel about it is that I think it's got both positives and negatives to it, but I, I always like to think that because of my autism, I've been given more opportunities, I think, than if I was neurotypical like, for example, I'm speaking to you a lot today, which I don't think would have ever come up if I was in a mainstream school. I am very um, interested in maths and science because I think both of them... I love logical things because the world is really confusing and I love things where there's a right and a wrong answer and there's steps to it and you know what you're doing. And I just like science because it you know, answers all the questions that I have about why does this happen and why does that happen. So I'm really sort of... you know. I'm creative in some aspects, but I prefer the sort of the logical, the analy analytical approach to things. Hello, my name is Beth and I'm 13 years old and I have autism. I was diagnosed when I was three, which I was told was quite a young age for an autistic girl to be diagnosed. And I like a lot of things that girls without autism like. Like I like music, I like dancing, and I like social media. But I don't understand my autism. I don't get it. Lots of people, I haven't had people say to me what it's like, what it's about, and I get confused a lot about it. So <laughs> I don't understand it at all. Hi, I'm back again. Um, I'm just going to stop you there, right? Moya could do this all day, okay? So basically, you know, so at some point I might have to drag her off the mark. Okay, carry on, Moya. Okay, how my autism impacts me. Just so you know, I forgot to mention about my diagnosis. I was about two, three when it happened, and... Um, oh, I've got Asperger's. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. But anyway, my autism impacts me by things like anxiety. It, I'm thinking it can make me quite forgetful because that's one thing I have been thinking about recently. Also, I have worries about the future because I do need quite, not quite a lot, but, you know, moderate support for it. Um, but they're the negatives about it. Now we're on to the positive section. Okay. As I was saying before about my art, all the things that I draw tend to come from my head. And also I have my own 
imaginary land in there because you may have heard from people previously that they have like an imaginary world as well so do I I've had it since I was four and I still love it today and also it's like a place I can go to when I'm stressed but or just in general when I'm bored in class you know it's a good place to be and Creativity is one of my favourite things. It's like, put the books away, grab the drawing book and start drawing. Also, it's a good way of relaxing as well for some people with autism. Just on a side note, because I forgot to say, I am 15 years old, just to put that out there. Um, I find that I constant, I feel that I overthink things quite a lot, especially when I'm anxious. I'm always worrying about other people's view on me, whether I'm doing the right thing. Sometimes, even in a social situation, if I say something, I worry that I've come, off, come across in the wrong way, or whether people think I'm hiding something, or whether I'm saying it and they think maybe I'm worried when actually I'm not, or whether my tone of voice was off. I'm always constantly thinking about things that personally I don't believe that neurotypical people think about and that they just sort of do stuff whereas I've got a billion and one questions in my head and I'm always thinking about like other people and whether just overthinking most things really. I find that I overreact a lot to little arguments I have with people at home or at school or something someone might have said to me which I take really personally. And sometimes I wake up in the morning and I think or worry about what's going to happen at school because I've got a class who are all so different to each other and we tend to have a lot of arguments and that makes me think a lot. And sometimes I don't want to come into school because of the arguments. And sometimes I get, I can't get away from them and I get dragged into them. And it's the same at home. I overreact to a lot of things at home. Like my brother and my dad like to tease me and it's like in a jokey way and I don't get it. And I would normally shout at them, tell them to shut up and go away. And I take things like that too personally as well. So it's overthinking. Okay, back to me again, for the millionth time. Um, as much as I love to socialise, now many of you, I bet, say, nine-tenths of this room, it's okay to be honest, have heard that autistic people don't like to socialise, they sit under the table, they walk out the room. Okay, that is some, but then there are others who love to socialise, like me. And I love, and also I love hugs as well. That can be social. Because there are some autistic girls who actually think a hug would help them, but they aren't given them, though. But then, after my long conversation, I need a bit of downtime. Otherwise, I get bored of it, and I might not be able to, like, say any more. Also... I just need to like chill every now and then. Maybe I could go back to the conversation and I have something else to say. But it's just one of those things, otherwise it will eventually seem like I have to talk to the person. It's a chore, eventually. But I know that's not necessarily the case, but that's why downtime is very important. So in some uh, social situations, um, I can get extremely anxious, and then in other social situations, I'm 100% comfortable. So my anxiety varies depending on the situation. Normally, it's due to unexpected people or an unexpected event, but there are some situations where I, c I can't speak to people because I'm so anxious, and I'm you know constantly thinking of other people, and I can't think straight, and I'm really, really extremely anxious. And then there are other situations, like when I go up in the morning or I go to school, and I'm completely fine. You know, there's like no anxiety whatsoever. But just because I 
don't get just because I'm not anxious in those situations doesn't mean that I don't have anxiety at any time because my anxiety just sort of fluctuates with depending on what the situation is when it comes to friendships for me it's all about common interest and what I have in common with people and what people have in common with me and again my class is all different to each other so there'd be certain people I talk to a lot because of we have so much in common and then there'd be other people I wouldn't really talk to at all because I don't have a lot in common with them and it's all just for me about common interests and if I don't if I'm talking to someone and we don't have a lot in common, I try talking to them again and again and then eventually I just give up and move on and find someone else to talk to and find out their common interest and if we have anything in common. Okay. You know, I like to go out as much as the other person does. But there are times that when I do go out, I walk in the streets and have this horrible feeling inside me, this tightness of the heart that someone is watching me. Someone might follow me. You know, it's not a nice feeling. I do sometimes like <coughs> try and speed up a little bit without the person noticing, but then there's that worry that they're going to suddenly shout something or run up to me or laugh at me. I know that it, they're only like, specifically with a group of boys, I know they're only trying to like have some fun, but I feel they could be a bit more considerate of the people around them. Even though at the time they may not be thinking that, at least if they know, that would be helpful. And Often, I, I don't like to go out on my own. I never do. I prefer to go out with someone else because it's just a nicer feeling so you have someone to talk to so you don't get bored. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. I kind of lost what I was gonna say there. Um, I. Um, whenever um, I like to plan things quite a lot, I find that planning is extremely helpful for me. Um, so, you know, I can go to the shops and I can buy things, you know, if I, you know, always look at it beforehand. But if, for example, I have to go somewhere and I have to return something or ask for a refund, I find that um, quite difficult. And I um, have to pre plan in my head what I'm going to say to that person and, you know, say it to myself over and over again because otherwise I find that I kind of trip over my words or I don't get it out clear enough. So um, I was in a shop the other day and I had my camera with me and I wasn't sure which cable I needed and there was just someone standing there. And so I just tried to ask them for what cable, but I hadn't planned it beforehand. So I ended up sort of it all stumbling out. But luckily they got the message after a while. But I find if I, um, things unexpectedly, like if, for example, I've got to speak to someone or someone says, oh, can you run a message to someone? I have to um, consciously plan it and make sure that I know exactly what I'm going to say. Because otherwise I find that I can't get the words out or I kind of mix them around and I don't say it in a clear enough fashion for them to understand. When it comes to going out um, and taking your phones out and talking to people, I'm sure that a lot of you like taking your stuff out, like your phones with you. I find it hard. Like last Christmas, my mum and dad got me an iPod Touch and I would never take it out of my room or the house. I would leave it in the house at all times. And then after a few months, about two months or so, I started taking it with me to my friend's house whenever I stayed overnight. And I kept doing that until again a few months later I started taking it out with me to the shops and I kept building up that confidence and now I take it with me everywhere 
well, not today, but everywhere else. And back in November, my mum and dad got me a phone, and I take that everywhere with me as well. So I like taking them with me now. But I don't like people touching them. I don't let my friends touch them, say if they want to see a picture, I would show them it, but when they start sliding through all the other pictures, I go, no, I don't want you to look at that, I don't even like people touching it. And I don't even let my family touch it, I don't let my sister touch it, my brothers touch it. Sometimes I won't even let my parents touch it, or them. But I only let my parents use it, or touch it when they need to, say if I don't know what to do or I need to download something and I don't know how, that's when I'd get my mum and dad to help me or somehow do it for me. I find that being given time and patience is um, extremely important for um, autistic individuals if they're finding social situations difficult. Um, I'm in foster care and uh, about three months ago, we had a new girl join us, and I found it extremely difficult to socialise with her. I was constantly worried about social opportunities with her. I'd worry about going down to breakfast if I had to say hello to her. And for, I think, almost a month, I didn't even say a word to her. And I found it really anxiety-inducing, and I found it quite hard. And then I started to slowly say good morning and things, but even then, I was constantly worrying about, am I not socialising enough? Does she think I'm ignoring her? Does she think I'm avoiding her, like I overthink? But now, um, two months later, um, after Christmas, Christmas was extremely, um, I was extremely anxious about Christmas because I wasn't sure what she was into. I didn't know what present to get her. I was really worried about that. And now, after Christmas, we talk all the time, there's no anxiety, you know, we're, you know, really good friends, we socialise all the time, you know, see so at breakfast and we have a good laugh together. Whereas two months ago, I couldn't even say one word to her, let alone now, I can really socialise. And I think it's just because, um, you know, it, because of time and sort of giving patience that over the time I've just been able to build up my confidence and now, you know, we're really good, you know, I'd say that we're friends now, so, you know, we're the same age as well, so it really helps just to be given time and patience to help people overcome their anxiety. Now we are on one of the major things in my history. Anxiety. Yep. Anxiety in me can be very discreet, but over time there are some noticeable traits. Like, I start to become quite fidgety, that generally is shown by a leg twitch, and then I get, like, hungry because I actually quite like to eat when I'm anxious because it's something I'm in control of. And another thing, I love eating. And it kind of just makes me feel better because it kind of also, in a way, is a little bit of a distraction. Then I could then, depending on how anxious I am, I can be quite tired. And then... Even during my tiredness, when I know it's too early to go to bed, I search for distractions like a games console or drawing, or perhaps just go on my iPad for a bit. But then the nature of the worry affects how much or how well I can sleep. Because, say if I'm worried about schoolwork or homework, that's one of the things where it's actually happened quite recently. I don't know if you've heard this, but there was a time where I had a bit of overdue homework and I was up all night doing it because I was so scared that I'd get into loads of trouble when actually the problem wasn't as big as I thought it'd be. And then if I'm like annoyed or worried about something at home, I tend to want to go to sleep so I can cut that bit of the day off and then start again. And then, if I don't sleep well, it affects my school performance, like the time of the homework. 
and my controlled assessment paper one in science. That didn't go very well first time because I was actually, you know, too tired to actually answer the questions properly. Thankfully, there was a spare paper at hand, and without cheating, I redid it all completely. And I got, I felt that I actually did a lot better on it the second time round because I had more sleep, the anxiety was over, and I was more relaxed. And when I'm anxious, I can be very irritable. Normally, I'm the jokey person, as you can tell, but when I'm anxious, I sometimes sit there alone, like, you know, people try and cheer me up by saying, hey, why are you, like, so moody or way down dumps? I, I know it's a joke, but then I snap at them sometimes without meaning to. And then what happens is it makes me feel bad because, you know, you might have helped a previous autistic person and then they snap at you saying, oh, go away, or something like that. But with, without meaning to, they might have upset someone. And then you might notice their behaviour might get a bit worse afterwards. That's because they actually feel bad for what they did some of the time. But they just are not quite in the right frame of mind to make it up. So then that links in with what Lucy says about patience. Uh, like Miss Ward said, I find that my anxiety is a roller coaster. Um, every, I think pretty much every day of my life I'm anxious at least once about something. And I'm not talking about deliberating anxiety, I'm just talking about mild anxiety where I feel it sort of rise inside of me. Um, I have you know, quite a different range of anxiety. Sometimes it can go like really high and then I feel like I can't do anything and then other times it only spikes a little bit. Like before coming up on stage and talking to you, there was a, you know, a mild spike in my anxiety, but you know, I managed to get through it. And I find that um, when I get quite anxious, I find that um, my stomach tightens and I wring my hands more than usual. Um, I feel like they're um, I, uh, there almost isn't enough air in the room sort of like there's like these imaginary walls like pushing in on me so I'm still breathing at the right rate I just feel like there isn't enough air and I'm still aware of when I get extremely anxious I'm still aware of everything that's going on but it's almost as if it just blurs out and I'm not focusing on it and instead of exploding outwards and you know possibly having aggressive behavior I almost implode inside my head and I go inside myself and I worry you know I constantly think about the worry and I forget about what's going on around me and I just sort of play it over in my head or you know the feelings inside me get stronger and um, I sometimes get hypersensitive to noise sometimes but when I'm anxious my brain goes on to high alert and I get hypersensitive about lots of things. I get, you know, even the slightest of noise makes it spike even more. Um, I find it really hard if someone um, touches me and I don't know they're going to, maybe even a tap on the shoulder or people being in close contact with me, just, you know, standing around other people. I find that quite difficult because I find, you know, because my brain is thinking that everything should be an anxiety-inducing thing when actually it shouldn't. And then... Um, as my anxiety gets worse, I withdraw from people in social situations, so I stop talking um, and I don't pay attention to sort of what's going on and I don't listen to people, not because I'm ignoring them, just because I'm too focused on something else. And that can then create a vicious cycle because if I'm originally worried about not socialising enough, then that leads to me not socialising, which then in, you know, lessens the social interaction I have with other people. And I also find that when I get quite anxious, I get quite paranoid of other people. I worry that other people know I'm anxious, almost as if it's like a bad thing. So even if I'm trying my hardest to you know, keep my anxiety under control and not let people on, it's almost as if I believe that there's some sort of pheromones or something that people instinctively know that I'm anxious and I know it's not a bad thing but my rational mind at that point you know doesn't want people to know and then worries about that which then leads to it spiraling out of control and I some have to find a way to try and stop that before it gets any worse. 
A big part of my anxiety is my temper. What lots of people say is I bring these shutters down, I shut everyone out, I won't talk to anyone, I get quite moody, I won't... If someone tries to help me, I would just shut them out like everyone else and a lot of that tends to be about something that's in my head and if it gets too much I would walk out of class and then that's when care staff start like come and find me and bring me back to lesson or let me talk to them about what happened and why I'm anxious and angry and they will help me try and sort it out. S strategies. My strategies can vary. Like, I sometimes like to sit on my own, you know, in a room with good internet signal, otherwise I'm kind of stuffed. <laughs> but I like to sit and listen to music on my iPad listen to all the songs I like. I don't care what song it is, and I don't care what other people would think of that <clears> song. <throat> if I like it, I listen to it. And I'd find something funny on YouTube, because every weekend when I should be doing homework and revision, I find something funny on YouTube to watch instead. Hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. I love, like... <coughs> I literally love YouTube, it's my life at home. I practically go on it every day of my life. Just for about half an hour on a school night and about five hours at the weekend on per day. But that's not that long, is it? Yes. And then... <laughs> yes, it is, Moya. That's a really long time. <laughs> and then, <coughs> other things are... I like distractions. I like to draw. Even if it's not the best picture, I have something else to focus on. Something that my head of... sometimes not the most amazing wonders, but enough, come out. I just think of something. Or just draw something which I thought of for a while but haven't had the chance to draw. Even if it's a rough sketch of it, I could then do a better one later. And then I sometimes look at the work I've done. Sorry, I couldn't bring any. I completely forgot. But what happens is, is that I look back at the pictures and think, what an amazing masterpiece. And that was from, oh yeah when I was anxious about how my friendship with so-and-so was going. I drew that amazing picture. Because sometimes some of the best pictures can come out of stress or anxiety, or some even better ones come out of happiness. Because artwork can sometimes reflect the mood of the person as well, depending on the nature on it. Say if someone's done a really dark, gloomy person, like someone sat under a dark tree, that might mean that they're actually stressed or they're upset or they're anxious. But if they draw something bright, colourful, say, girl skipping with her friend and smiling, which I don't draw, it's just an example, that must mean that they're in an elated mood. That means they must be happy. Another thing I like to do is, if it's late enough in the evening, is have a nap because, as I said, Anxiety makes me exhausted. Mm. And as I said, it cuts off the bad part of the day. It's like a sausage. Imagine a day as a sausage, and then one side of it is burnt, and the other side of it is well cooked. I just cut the burnt bit off. That's when I have my nap. And then I just have the nice bit. <laughs> and then... The horrible H word, yes, homework, sadly. I have been given a homework timetable, and this was basically designed for me near the end of year nine and early year 10. This is when the whole thing came into action. Sorry. 
I'm given a homework timetable to help me plan when I'm going to do my homework because when I was going to do it was one of the biggest issues why I didn't do it in the first place and it actually helps me keep on top of it a bit better okay maybe there are some bits that are overdue still by about nine weeks but I just don't remind anyone about it and they won't know <laughs> Or I get irritated when someone hands in their homework and they're like, oh yes, anyone got any homework? I'm just sat there quietly thinking, please don't look at me. You're giving away all your tricks. I know. Girls, we've got about two minutes. I know, but they need to know some of the tricks so as other people might use them. Two minutes. <laughs> and another thing is, I let things sorted ASAP, as soon as possible. I go and tell a trusted member of staff or a trusted person. I used to talk to friends more, but I realised they couldn't really do a lot about some of the things I worried about. So I like to talk to a member of staff that I know will sort the problem quickly. I like it sorted as... I know some problems can't be sorted soon, but others can, and the ones that can... Hmm. I want to be sorted as soon as they possibly could be sorted. That also takes stress off me for the rest of the day. And also, I know that problem's sorted and that's something off my checklist because anxiety, for me, is like a jar and a marble. Each second I have the anxiety, a marble is added to the jar slowly making it heavier. It's like a jar, backpack. It's like one on your back, but each time it just gets heavier and heavier. And then when it becomes too heavy, it snaps off, the jar smashes, and all of that worry, all of that stress slips out, and that can lead to me having a meltdown. I only had one in year 11, because obviously, a few things happened at home and then a few things happened at school that day. But I knew it couldn't have really been sorted that well. Year 10 wasn't the best year for me. Moya, right, I'm just going to stop you there and just give Lucy and Beth a turn because we've got one more minute left. Okay, okay. I'll, thank you. I'll just cut this bit short. Okay, thank you. It wasn't a very good year, so I had a few and then obviously they've improved over the years because year 7 I was literally screaming about everything. <laughs> I find, <laughs> I find it uh, a lot easier to write my anxieties down before I give them to someone because that way I can uh, think about what logical order to put them in. I can write, you know, make sure that I've written it in the clearest way possible and I can organise it better than if I'm speaking it. And I also find that sometimes when I'm extremely anxious I can't speak at all. So I find it quite easier if I write something down and then give it to someone and then they speak to me about it afterwards so I know that they, they've got it oh, sorry, in the clearest way possible. Um, another thing I find quite useful is sort of stepping out of the situation. So if I'm in a anxiety, if I'm in a social situation that's really giving me lots of anxiety, just sort of stepping out, getting some fresh air, taking some deep breaths to sort of you know calm myself, I find that quite useful to feel a little bit better before then going back. Um, I find that some breathing techniques actually are quite useful. Um, I, I use this one where you breathe in for five, hold for seven, and then out for eight. Because that way I look at my watch and I count it, so I'm focusing on the counting as well as the breathing. Um, and I find that an important thing to do if you're dealing with someone who's quite anxious and you're working through their anxieties with them is to approach things in relation to their strengths. So some people are creative, so you might want to use analogies to help them or metaphors. Whereas for me, I'm quite logical, so applying it in quite a sort of a step-by-step -step analytical approach for me is extremely useful. And another sort of um, distraction thing I do is sometimes just going for a walk to sort of clear my head, uh, to think about other things I find is um, quite useful as well when I'm anxious. I like to distract myself as a strategy, like I would, at home I would put some music on and I would dance in my room. No one else is there to judge me and say, oh, you can't dance, you can't do this, you can't do that. It's just me and my own little world. Um, when I'm at school, I like to 
fidget with some toys. So in my school bag, I have like a toy, like a calm toy or two. That's what we like to call them at school, calm toys. Or like Moya, I like to draw, I like to colour things in. And that's just what I like to do at home or both at school. And back to the walking out of class, I would talk to someone who gets it. Because some, no matter who I tell, sometimes I'd feel like that person gets it more than another person. And it's just, for me, all about understanding it and understanding the situation. And for me, and how big it is to me and not to other people. Just a, a last note, actually, something that I just wanted to add, is how I think it's very important to think that just because someone's got a weakness and anxiety doesn't mean that they can't overcome it. Because in the last, you know, and I think it's very important to not lose hope and to not give up when working with someone because um, in the last few years, you know, like, you know, two months ago, I couldn't speak to that girl and now I'm having, you know, really good conversations. Uh, two years ago, I was extremely anxious about going on a plane and, you know, I was almost crying and I thought, you know, how my how's my future going to be if I can't get around to other countries? And then I got on the plane and it was all good and now I like flying. And there's been, you know, and I think just understanding because actually on Christmas I forgot to give this girl a present and I just put something together and I made her a Christmas card. And in the Christmas card I actually just explained I'm autistic, I find things hard, I sometimes get anxious because I didn't want her to feel like I didn't like her or anything. And then suddenly after Christmas, you know, everything's been going smoothly. So I think not losing hope and not giving up and just working with the person you know, if someone's extremely anxious about something almost to a phobia level and it's deliberating and it's affecting many aspects of their life, it doesn't mean that they can't, you know, with a bit of help and a bit of patience, it doesn't mean that they can't work for it because I've worked through things, you know, flying, going to the dentist, speaking to people, you know, speaking up here and things that I thought I would never be able to do and, you know, just trying to work through in a way that is suitable for the person and in a way that benefits them the most. <laughs> I don't really think I can add to that particularly. I think, I think between them, they've, they've all said it really clearly and really well. Um, hopefully what you will take away from this is if you've met one autistic girl, you've met one autistic girl and they're all really different to each other and they've all got lots and lots to say uh, and that they are really different to boys on the spectrum uh, and that's, uh, I think that's a real blessing actually. Um, what occurs to me when I'm listening to this, because obviously we, re we rehearsed this once, <laughs> Actually, you rehearsed it more than once, but I've heard it once. And I think there are some action points for school around Beth understanding her autism. And also just, you know, it's really difficult to learn, isn't it, when your head is full of worry. And actually managing all of those little tiny anxieties all day long, it's just, it must be really tiring and really exhausting. And then when you have all the demands of everyday life on top of that, that's, that's quite a big ask, isn't it? So maybe when you're in the field and you're working with young people with autism, just bear that in mind, because actually if you've got all of that background autism going, uh, background anxiety kind of happening, that's, that's really hard for you to have enough energy and oomph left to kind of get, get on with the rest of it. Although we do obviously expect them to do that. And then speak at conferences and write books and be in documentaries. So, um. <laughs>